we're about ready to start. It is 9.42, so I'm gonna zoom through this. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to Eagle Marsh. Wait, Carl, are you ready? I am. All right, action. <laughs> All right, welcome to Eagle Marsh, everyone. Uh, my name is Allie Munger. I'm the wetland educator here. Uh, I work for a nonprofit called Little River Wetlands Project. Um, and so Eagle Marsh, a lot of people are, I know a lot of you, actually, how many of you have never been to Eagle Marsh before? Could you raise your hand? Awesome, I love that. <laughs> have you been here? Yes. Your mom's like, yeah, you've been here. Well, welcome back to those that have and welcome to those that haven't been here. Eagle Marsh um, is a very special place. Um, you can see kind of the fireflies starting to sparkle, well, lightning bugs starting to sparkle. Um, so, being at Eagle Marsh at nighttime is a little bit of a treat. We don't do this too often. So I hope that we get to actually find some mods today. Um, but I'm gonna go through a presentation and talk about mods. Um, but real quick, Eagle Marsh is about 835 acres. It's free to come here and hike anytime. Looks like there's might be a couple of green herons right there flying ahead. So coming out here, you'll definitely see something um, and you are welcome to come out here. Even if the gate is closed, feel free to come back here and hike and walk um, until about this time, then you gotta scoot on home unless you're here at a special program like this. I love you want, well, we're gonna use those nets. We're gonna use those nets after my presentation, okay? Cool. <laughs> All right, so, um, like I said, my name's Allie, but I do have um, a really important volunteer with us today. If, you, if Jeff Ormiston could please stand up and, or give a wave, you know, whatever you'd like to do. <laughs> he probably knows way more about mods than I do, but I'm really gonna try. I put, I put this inf uh, information together. He's raised mods. Um, he's an incredible naturalist, so if you have any questions, please ask him as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's, let's, let's get started. So we're gonna be talking about moths versus butterflies. Um, we're gonna be talking about our invasive moth that we have here. Uh, we'll talk about endangered and threatened moths, the importance of moths, how to help moths, and then mothing. Mothing, um, we're gonna be doing some of that. So um, moths are insects belonging to the order Lepidoptera. Um, there are many, many, there are probably 150 to 500,000 um, species in um, this order, and 90% of them are moths. 90% of them make up. So, um, if you want to talk about historical findings, moths were found way before butterflies were found. They're nocturnal, which probably is the reason why we're here at night, and they are most, meaning that they're most active during the night, and then Butterflies, they're most active during the day. That's called diurnal. Um, I'm not saying that all moths are only active during the night. I'm just saying they are majority, they're mostly active at nighttime. So they are incredibly important as pollinators and food sources for a lot of animals. And they both, butterflies and moths, go through a, meta, a complete metamorphosis um, from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis or cocoon um, to the adult. And this here is just some of the moths that are here in Indiana. We might catch a moth on the TV screen tonight is what it's looking like. So I guess I did say this, 160,000 species of moths in the world, uh, and then about 17,000 species of butterflies. So th they're still being discovered. Uh, and in the U.S. alone, there's around 11,000, so that's quite a bit. But in Indiana, there's about 498 um, species, so I don't think I could fit all of those on one slide, um, but maybe we'll find some today. But have you guys ever heard of a bio blitz or a bio inventory is now kind of what we're calling it. Um, so we did one in 2014, and what it is, it's a group of experts and they have like a different um, like one studying mammals one's looking for insects one's looking for aquatic animals and they're just taking an inventory and also of plants they're taking an inventory writing down all the different species they can in a 24-hour period so we did one in 2014 that was about 10 years ago and we found um, 18 different butterfly species so we didn't find too many I don't know um, obviously I, I mean I was not there so I do not know what 
all came about with that, but we are doing one in 2024 in June. Uh, I don't know what the exact date is yet. I think it might be my birthday actually, so that'd be really fun. Um, but we're gonna be looking for lots of different um, species, so it'll be cool to come out with that information um, probably around the end of 2024. We'll see how many more we have. And this is one of our moths that we do have in Indiana, Luna moths. They're very beautiful. Um, some people call them moon moths. So the largest moth known is the atlas moth. It's about 10, um, it, the caterpillar can be about five inches, but then the uh, wingspan of these can be about 10 and a half inches, very large. And these are pretty cool. Along with the luna moth, this moth as well, they only live about two weeks. So when you think of butterflies and a lot of moths, they have that, that straw-like mouth part, their proboscis. Um, to, to get down into um, like longer flowers to get the nectar. And these guys here, they, when they uh, emerge as an adult, they don't have that mouth part. They don't feed, they do not eat at all uh, during its adult life of those two weeks. Um, but yeah, so they have an inability to feed after they emerge, so they, they pass away, they die after two weeks. So you might be wondering, how do I identify moths? There really is no distinct um, division of these two. Uh, it's just based on observable differences. So if you look here, a lot of people notice the differences by the shape of their antennae. And if you look here, the, the butterfly antenna here, they have kind of these, um, they're kind of knobs or swellings and they're, a lot, some people describe them, I think as spoons on the end. Um, so if you look, the butterfly antenna will have that. There's also skippers, um, and they have hooks. But moths, they can have this feather-like um, this feather-like antenna. Some of them are also just straight hairlines, uh, thread-like, I guess. Um, but they do not have knobs. So, like I said, it's an artificial one. The division is artificial. Um, based on those differences, and there's no there's no single feature that really separates all of them. You really you really can't tell. But just by this, we've got kind of a Venn diagram of usually a thin body, um, very colorful, but not always. There are some incredibly beautiful, colorful moths. The pupa is called a chrysalis, and then our moths over here, the pupa is inside the cocoon that they form. Usually active during the day diurnal that's what that means diurnal and then active at night that's more familiar to you probably nocturnal um, they have clubbed antennae are like I said our butterflies do these they have feathery but they also have they're not all feathery okay they're not all feathery um, and when they land when they land our butterflies land with their wings together and then our um, moths land with their wings open so that's pretty cool. Some insects do that, um, like, what is it? Dragonflies land with their wings open and damselflies land with their wings closed. So there are some different critters that do certain things like that. But what they do have in common is they have um, scaly wings. So I'm gonna try and set up the microscope after this and we're gonna, we can look at some scales and maybe look, I do have two moth specimens that we can look at. Um, and then they also, like I said, do that complete metamorphosis. Um, so the word Lepidoptera actually comes from the Greek word, uh, it actually comes from the Greek meaning scaly wing. So it's kind of neat. So like I said, they have a rainbow of colors. A lot of people think that they're dull and brown. There are a lot of dull and brown ones, but some are very, very beautiful. Like in these three moths I'm about to show you, they do exist here in Indiana. Uh, so we've got our rosy maple moth. I want that as a stuffy. I would sleep with that stuffy all night. And then we have our Luna moth. That's that moth that doesn't have those uh, mouth parts. So you'd be really lucky to see one of these since they're only around for about two weeks. And then we have our hummingbird moth. These are incredibly cool moths. You might think you found a hummingbird, but it's actually a moth. And they actually have these glass wings. I think this is called, oh yeah. I think this might be specifically called maybe a clear wing hummingbird moth because it has those clear wings. If you look up the glass wing butterfly, you can see straight through those. There's some, there's some really incredibly cool, I, I encourage you to go look at some. 
Um, so, when they fly, I did cover this. Um, butterflies diurnal, meaning what? Daytime. Yeah. <laughs> and nocturnal, meaning at night. So there are moths. There are moths that come out during the day, and there are um, butterflies. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if there's butterflies that come out at night. I can't speak on that. But there are butterflies. So okay. All right. All right. All right. Diurnal meaning day. Nocturnal meaning coming out at night. What? There. Oh man. It, you can read it. What are butterflies that are crepuscular? What does crepuscular mean? What do you think? Dawn and dusk. They come out in dawn and dusk. So some other crepuscular animals, um, deer, deer are a crepuscular animal. You'll see them um, early in the morning and you'll see them. Maybe you saw them coming down the lane. I don't know. We probably spooked a lot of them. So they do, they do both go through that full metamorphosis. But if you look here, cocoons are specific to moths and chrysalises are formed by butterflies. So this is kind of interesting. So this chrysalis is the pupa. It is. So when in stars of a, of a caterpillar butterfly, when they shed their, their skin to go on to their next, um, when they molt, they go on to their next form. And then this guy is, this is what it becomes. This is the pupa. So um, if it was a moth, it'd be like this is inside of there. So we have our moth and they form it around and then they form into their pupa. So they can be found at attached to the side of different, I found them in like um, crevices of a house. Um, you can find them on trees. I actually, I, I know that some moths, they'll actually, um, I was gonna say cocoon eyes, but that's not really a word or anything. They, they spin their cocoon inside of like a plant that might be hollowed out so and sometimes they overwinter that way so a lot of moths they'll overwinter um, as um, either eggs or even in one of these guys so if you look here we've got our life cycle here this is the life cycle of our moth but we do have one moth here in Indiana. It is called the spongy moth, um, formerly known as the European gypsy moth, if you've heard of that before. Um, it is native to Europe and it first arrived to the United States in the 1800s, in the late 1800s. Um, and it's a pest because it really has a voracious appetite and can really impact tree population. And there's about 300 species of trees here. Um, and shrubs, which pose a danger to, to North America's forests. So the caterpillars, they absolutely defol defoliate the trees. Um, they, it's not the butterflies, it's the caterpillars. So these are just a list of some of the trees that, that, um, that they affect. So aspen, birch, cedar, cottonwood, fruit trees, oak trees, and <laughs> over there, there are, you'll see nothing but many different varieties of oak trees. So. Um, we, we really hope that we do not have this. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of effort to help um, combat this moth and make sure um, that we are keeping it. Uh, I think, actually, I think it maybe have landed in Boston, Massachusetts, it, or it was definitely on the East Coast. Um, and it's kind of worked its way. Fort Wayne and, I should have put a map in here. You'll have to look up the, um, the range of it. But this is what it looks like. I know it looks very cute, but um, the pupa is actually kind of interesting looking. But if you look here, um, that's the adult. There's this little cute little face. These are what the caterpillars will look like. And then there's the pupa. So this is their life cycle. Um, right about now, um, they would be, uh, we've got July, August, they're adults. So they would be um, laying eggs right now. So they would be laying eggs. Um, in July and August, and those will overwinter, um, and then they'll make their way and they'll hatch um, like early spring and end of April. So they've been found on everything from trees, house siding, car tires. Uh, each mass contain anywhere from 500 to 1,000 eggs. That's a lot of babies. Um, and like I said, they overwinter. 
But as I was reading, I was like, okay, I'm reading all of this about what, what to look for, and no one was really telling me what to do. But Michigan State University um, states to reduce the spongy moths. You can search for these moth egg masses on trees, firewood, or other furniture, outdoor furniture. You scrape the egg masses off into a bucket or a similar container filled with soapy water, or burn and bury the egg masses. Don't leave the eggs or bits of egg mass on the ground. Those eggs can often hatch the following spring. So if you are looking to do this at your homes, that's what they suggest. All right. So there are more than 20 butterflies and moths listed as endangered here in the U.S. Most of these species are found in the U.S. and they become a lot of the reason that a lot of these moths and butterflies are becoming insects in general, you're seeing a lot more, in, lot less insects getting smashed on your windshield, different things, you know, cueing into that is because a lot of our habitat loss, a lot of their habitat is gone um, due to development. So the best thing that you can do, create monarch waste stations, plant these different plants that can help um, support these moths. Um, and your observations and citizen science data, that is very helpful too. We do um, a monarch butterfly watch here. Um, so people come around and they look at all the different milkweeds. Um, and so today we're pretty much doing this because tomorrow is the start of National Moth Week. But moths are incredibly important. Um, they are really important pollinators. Uh, so one thing, one thing to think about is those moths that only live for about two weeks that don't have those mouth parts, they're not going to be flying from flower to flower, so those guys aren't really considered pollinators. But there are many, many, many um, pollinators that do have that um, mouth part that fly to all the different flowers. But they do, they do pollinate at nighttime, a lot of them do. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, they take the night shift. And a great thing about looking for moths at nighttime is we don't really have to worry about the bees. So, like I said, they do um, they do play this vital role in our uh, in our food web. Um, so a lot of a lot of in, uh, animals do depend on um, eating them. Important food for songbirds, mammals, and other insects. And. So there are different things that we can do to help them is we can, you know, manage our gardens and lawns less. Um, I have noticed that I don't really mow my lawn that much. And I like to say the excuses because it's for the insects. <laughs> but it really, you know, you can really notice a huge difference in the amount of insects that are in your yard if you're managing it less. Um, reduce those pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Um, and then reduce, uh, buy organic, that is very helpful. Um, and then also protect existing natural areas or support places that do, like Little River Wetlands Project. Uh, and turn out the lights, exterior lights, shade windows at night. We've kind of got an exception here um, that we're doing this event, so we do have these lights on here at night. Uh, and then document moths. If you got pictures, take pictures of them, post them to iNaturalist. Um, there are some, probably some other places that you can post them as well, but we really use iNaturalist a lot. Uh, and then plant host plants for moths. So host plants are the plant, so milkweed is a host plant to monarch butterflies, meaning that they can, all, the caterpillars only eat um, those leaves. So there are host plants for many, many, many different butterflies and moths. So you can plant those host plants. Uh, and you can look on different native plant websites, even Xerxes, X-E-R-C-E-S, they have um, some great resources on their website as well. So here are just three, three um, examples of some plants that you could plant in your yard to attract some, some moths. Um, the evening primrose, uh, it does get its name because the flowers open at dusk. So how are those flowers going to get pollinated during the day if they're closed? Um, so it's good that they open up and we've got moths. Uh, beard tongue. So we have a plant in here called foxglove beard tongue. Um, I, think, I, I think that it's actually finished blooming right now, but uh, it is a great nectar producer and it's visited by a lot of different pollinators. And it has kind of that bell-shaped, funnel-shaped flower um, so those insects can, can uh, get down in there. Um, and then blazing star, Leatris. It's very, a very beautiful plant. Um, and then we have our, our hummingbird moth here. Um, so they are, very, they are very attractive to many different pollinators. Um, so anything, anything that you do for a moth, anything that you do to a butterfly, 
um, for a butterfly in your own yard or anywhere else will support lots of different pollinators. So, like I said, the reason I'm doing this is because National Moth Week. So, National Moth Week starts tomorrow. It happens every week. Um, it hasn't been around for too long uh, because they started it because not a lot of moth research has been going on but this now they have many different countries uh, involved in this and you can go in and put kind of a project that you're doing and set what day you're doing it and you can list those pictures that you find of um, different moths and uh, post them and that helps a lot of scientists and helps people know what's out there you might be discovering new species who knows mm -hmm. but yeah it's a project of friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission um, and they do use iNaturalist. They also use something called the NOAA project, but I am not too familiar with that. Have you ever heard of that, Jeff? No. Yeah, I've never heard of that. So, something to look into. Um, but yes, we will be using iNaturalist. Well, I will be using it on my phone today. But moths do matter, and we are um, going to um, try and find some tonight. So, I we're doing something tonight called light sheeting or mothing. Um, and we kind of set up a few different lights in there. Some different moths are attracted to some different lights. Um, some, a lot of them are attracted to, um, what is it, mercury vapor lights. And then um, they also like UV lights or black lights. They're not really interested in LED lights. And I do have a couple over there to see, see what'll happen. But your porch light, I think there are a bunch of insects just right over there next to my door over there. So there's a lot of different things. But one of the most common methods, like I said, is attracting them to artificial light sources. So we set ours up just kind of like what she, um, she has done here. And the light source should attract moths from different areas. Um, and the sun has gone down, so hopefully they'll be coming out. Um, and so, like I said, we're going to be recording the pictures of the moths and the insects that we do find. Um, and we're going to use iNaturalist. And something really cool about iNaturalist, it'll actually help you ID them as well. I do have some ID and brochures um, and some different books and things, but um, sometimes you can't figure it out. And that is very helpful. So that will be contributing to citizen science or community science. Uh, and amateur enthusiasts, can you guys, anybody can contribute valuable information and valuable data um, to scientific research and conservation efforts. So us knowing what's out here can help us better manage the land and manage different areas to help benefit these, um, these anything, anything, to help benefit anything that we do find out here. But more specifically tonight, maybe we'll be able to benefit some mods. Um, so they play an essential role in our ecosystem. So the more we find out about them, the more um, we can uh, help them. So we're gonna go mothing. So things that you can do, you can do this at home. If you want to set up, you've got a front porch or back porch or nothing really, if you've got a light and are able to hang up a sheet, um, you could totally do this. I know there are, there are way more um, technical ways to do this. Um, you can also develop, I know that there's a concoction that you can create called moth bait and you can, uh, it's like old beer, rotten fruit, and you just mash it up and sit it in a bucket for like a few days. And then you can brush it on bark, you can brush it on areas um, where you are looking for um, moths, and maybe some will uh, fly along and, and maybe eat something. Um, but that, it won't harm, it won't harm your bark or anything like that. It might smell a little, but it won't harm anything. So, um, clear nights with no rain and the forecast are best. When I planned this in like January, I had no idea this would happen, but I'm very happy <laughs> that this is here. Um, so, we are ready. Um, it might take a while for us to see what's on the light, so we'll check it on our way out to the prairie. So we are gonna walk through our prairie so we get a little, little bit of a night hike in. I do have some, I do have some um, nets. So we'll be using some nets. Um, hopefully maybe you guys have, maybe, maybe you brought a flashlight, maybe you didn't, but maybe we can use our phone lights to look on the different flowers and things. Um, I have a few flashlights, <laughs> but we are going to do that. But you also need permission to go outside after dark. Do you guys have permission? Mm -hmm. All right, I think we do. <laughs> so that's it. That's all I have for our, our, our mods. Um, I can try and answer any questions that you might have. 
Uh, Jeff might be able to answer any questions as well. So, do you guys have any questions or do you want to get started? Let's get started. Yeah? Okay. So, if they're diurnal, why are they attracted to light? Oh, interesting. So, the thing about being tra attracted to light, I have read that it, it's not, I don't think it's been proven from what I've read. Um, I have read that some, uh, they're attracted maybe to the moonlight, is what I've read. But it has not been um, nothing. I don't think it has an answer has been. Yeah, I think I've read that they don't really know. Yeah, exactly. They don't really know. So uh, I, they have done some studies about the moon. Um, and then have you ever heard of like a moth drawn to a flame? They'll totally be attracted to that and then burn in a terrible death. So I don't know. Maybe maybe they'll be maybe you'll be the one to figure that out, Don. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Is that maybe. why we're like? They, yeah, turning that them? Yeah, turning off lights. Well, they're attracted to light because it, it, it would throw them off course. Uh, it um, also uh, causes um, easy, uh, like they're easy. Predation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, birds and bats can get to them easily if you're just drawing them all to one spot. Yes, absolutely. Never really thought about that. You know, like, you yeah. Know. It's also good for the. Uh, lightning bugs to not have your yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I see a lot of lightning bugs out there. That's cool. All right. Well, I am going to grab my, uh, grab some bugs. If you need any bug spray or anything, I do have some. What's that? I